is on track to make history. That's according to a recent analysis by a pair of organizations, the U.S. Elections Project and Nonprofit Vote. The study found last November experienced the highest turnout of any midterm since 1914. Now, one of the experts behind that analysis says there's a path to get even more people involved, adding states can supercharge another 100-year voter storm in 2020. My colleague Rena Ninen spoke to Michael McDonald, the founder and director of the U.S. Elections Project. Michael, you said that the 2018 election saw a historic amount of votes cast. In fact, voter turnout was up 13 percent from the 2014 midterms. You say that we could see another, and I'm quoting here, 100-year voter storm in 2020. What do you mean by that? Well, 2018 was the first election where we, in midterm election, where we saw more than 100 million votes that were cast in a midterm election. And, you know, the population is always growing, so we are better off talking about this in terms of turnout rates. We were above 50 percent of those eligible to vote in the 2018 election. You have to go all the way back to the early 1900s to see a turnout rate that was of similar size uh, in the history of the U.S. So um, it literally was 100 years since we saw as high of a turnout as we saw in 2018. And if you go just back a few years earlier, back to 2014, we had one of the lowest turnout rates. And uh, you go, uh, that was the lowest turnout rate uh, that we'd had since 1942 um, for a midterm election. And so there's only one real big variable that has changed since 2014 and 2018, and that's Donald Trump. Mm. Um, it's very clear he's driving interest in politics. Um, there's just all sorts of metrics we can look at, uh, small donor activity, viewership, um, in, uh, political news and consum consumption of political news, newspaper reading. Just all across the board, people are very engaged right now with politics. Yeah, they and certainly are, Michael. But, you know, despite those high numbers in 2018, only half of the eligible citizens who were able to vote actually cast a ballot. How do states get more people to, to be mobilized to actually vote on Election Day? Yes, there's a lot of variation across the states. Even though we were 50 percent of those eligible nationally, there were still some states out there that had more than 60 percent of their voters uh, participate in the election, while conversely, other uh, states had as low as 40 percent. So when we look at the states and we look at this variation of turnout across the states, we do see some common factors that drive turnout and figuring very prominently are some of the electoral rules. So things like same day registration, seven of the 10 highest turnout rate states have same day registration. Um, Mail ballot elections. So uh, there are some states that run their elections predominantly by mail ballots. We see that those states tend to also cluster at the higher end of turnout rates. Conversely, states that have very long registration deadlines of, say, 28 days prior to the election, those are the ones that are at the 40 percent level of turnout rates. And so registration figures prominently, the way in which ballots are delivered and the ease and convenience that people have to vote, those matter a lot. The other thing that the states don't quite have much control over but still figures prominently is competition. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a competitive race, people will see a reason to vote and they will show up and participate. I want to get into this idea of competition, how it kind of spurs higher turnout. You recommended something called nonpartisan redistricting. What is that and how do you do that independently? Well, in this last uh, um, election, actually, a number of states, both red and blue, adopted um, redistricting reform for their states. And so um, this has uh, been something that advocacy groups around the country have been pushing to have um, a, a commission of some sort that is not directly tied to the politicians drawing the districts. Um, and when they do that, they're not drawing the districts for the self-interest of the, of, the, of the politicians who might want to draw a very safe districts for themselves so that they can win re-election or a safe number of districts so that their party wins a majority. And so the hope is, and there's some evidence out of California, that when you have a nonpartisan process that is more citizen-led than um, led by politicians, what you get is more competition in the, in, uh, the, the districts. So competition can't solve the Electoral College, mm -hmm. you can't solve, uh, you know, 
Senate elections or gubernatorial elections, but it can address one of the issues that we do see in House of Representatives elections, where only about 10 percent of our elections uh, for the House of Representatives are truly competitive, and that's not really a good way to run a democracy. Speaking of the House, I want to talk to you about House Democrats. They recently passed a host of election reforms. Um, they were partly known as H.R. 1. What is this package in town, and do you really think we'll see this being turned into law? Well, it is very ambitious. It's uh, very broad in scope. It in, in encompasses some of the things I, I was talking about in terms of same-day registration. Um, there's also uh, a, an accompanying um, reform that's called automatic voter registration, which a number of states have adopted. And again, there's actually bipartisan consensus on this one. Um, both red and blue states are adopting automatic voter registration. That's you, if you go to a government office, like when you get your driver's license, you are automatically registered to vote. And that reform is very similar to same-day registration. We have some inkling that it does help turn out, but um, Oregon's the only state that's fully implemented it yet. So we don't have a lot of data to draw from to make definitive assertions that it will increase turnout. But Oregon's experience did see higher turnout as a consequence probably from uh, automatic voter registration mm -hmm. as more states come online we should see that so some of these um, structural reforms like uh, making registration easier that's part of HR 1 there's also some convenience so there's a no fault absentee voting for the entire country as one of the provisions there so that could be another thing that uh, could drive up turnout in the country um, and there's also nonpartisan redistricting reform is actually a part of H.R. 1, too. So it, it's very um, broad in scope uh, when you look at its ambitions. There's other things in there that um, are more aimed towards uh, rectifying some of the inequalities that have, have risen in elections in recent years, mainly the 2013 Shelby County decision that gutted part of the Voting Rights Act. So that's in there as well. So there's lots in there. But unfortunately, um, there's a perception that whenever you have a reform that increases turnout, that's necessarily going to help the Democrats. Because when you look at polling, usually if you look at a likely voter model versus a registered or all population model, mm -hmm. you tend to see the Republican Dem uh, candidates do better with a likely voter model. And that means that those are the people likely to vote. So if you can get the unlikely voters to vote, that might help out the Democrats. It's quite now, ambitious. There's quite a lot to it. I want to thank you very much. I want to thank you yeah. very much, Michael McDonald, for joining us. All right, you're welcome. That does it for today. You can stream Red